When we're growing up, especially if we're perceived as special or gifted, I feel like we're told a lot of the same things by adults in our lives. You're gonna be a millionaire when you grow up. You'll be an inventor. I bet you'll be the one to cure cancer. Obviously, they're trying to get us excited about stepping into the future, and in doing so, we'll be hyperbolic. That said, these things are not just conditioning us to look forward to the future, but also condition us to narrow our focus to goals of vanity. Even if you were such a person at the time, I doubt it's common that we're told, you're going to be so kind when you grow up. It's not exactly a shocking revelation that so early during our entry into the world that we're conditioned towards its principles and ways of thinking. In this case, temporary things like money, wits, and capability. It's a sobering thought to remember that you will not have your youth forever, nor your health, your smarts, or your money. This is not to say that you shouldn't strive to be someone who's healthy, smart, or well-to-do, but that these are qualities you shouldn't rely on as a permanent pillar that holds up who you are. I think many people who have an existential crisis late into their lives do so because they lean too much on one or more of these temporary qualities. They look back at when they were fit and capable, or when they could flaunt their money a little, or when they were quick and clever. Sometimes, we're lucky enough to be able to take these traits to the grave, but one you can always bet on making it there is kindness. You can be rich or poor, young or old, and still wear that on your sleeve with pride for as long as you choose to, not as long as time decides you're able to. When people say love is eternal, this is what they mean. It's easy to get an eye roll when you proclaim it because the divorce rate here runs contrary to this belief, but it's important to remember that there are different kinds of love, and kindness is a love for not only yourself, but your community and humanity as a whole. That certainly isn't easy, and for a positive personal quality that you can always bet on staying with you until you're passing, reality certainly makes you work for it. Kindness requires a lot of things, but most importantly of them, patience. Just like kindness, patience is a skill you will always find use of, and something you will always be working on. Some might even argue that patience and kindness are basically the same thing. What's nice about this practice is that it becomes a mission statement. The chase in pursuit of it becomes part of the meaning of life. This reminds me of an iconic Star Trek scene where they're about to send an uppity, self-important, but recently humbled businessman back to Earth. Then what will happen to us? There's no trace of my money. My office is gone. What will I do? How will I live? This is the 24th century. Material needs no longer exist. Then what's the challenge? The challenge, Mr. Offenhaus, is to improve yourself, to enrich yourself. Enjoy it. While I'm sure I don't need to explain that this is how a post-capitalist, post-scarcity society would work, because I'm sure you already think about that in your free time, let's use a different example and say that you really do end up in the highly unlikely scenario of being rich enough to have fuck you money. What? what now? You're at the end of the chase when the chase was the thing most people were spending their whole life on anyways. When you ask most people what they want in this world, it's either money or power. Those aren't actual pursuits. They're not real goals. What they're actually telling you is that they wish for the obstacles that get in the way of achieving one's true passions to disappear. What immensely less people have an answer to is what would you do with your life if you were unrestricted by money and power? That is why I bring up this conundrum. When your pursuit is about obstacles instead of self-improvement or identity, it's meaningless. What's unfortunate, too, is that one is seen as competent, ambitious, and forward-thinking if their goals are money and power. But if you say, I hope to be a kinder person, that sounds suspicious, because most tend to assume that you have that goal in mind if you're presently not a kind person. The implication always being that people are supposed to strive for things they don't have, usually money and power. But you can be a kind and or patient person and still hope to keep building on that. When they say there's always room for improvement, they don't mean perfection isn't the end, they mean a mission statement is always unfinished. Maybe this next part is more of a me thing, but I want to share it because it might encourage some people to be even better revolutionaries. I'm inspired when somebody accepts that they're always learning, that they're timid to use the word mastered or perfected. It's when people say things like, I'm a practicing Buddhist, or I'm a student of Zen. They acknowledge that something so powerful is never truly completed because it's a lifelong process. Now, I don't believe in organized religion or stubbornly sticking to one restrictive dogma because we shift with time and latch on to new ideas that are more capable of helping us in the specific chapter of life we're in. So, for me, I've narrowed down this lifelong practice to one skill, and that is patience. I'm always practicing patience. This practice has taught me a lot about what patience really is and how we should go about our most important goals. Just as I previously mentioned that there are different kinds of love, I'd argue that there are different kinds of patience. 
When I say patience, I think most people imagine utility patience, which is your ability to be bored for short periods of time and ride it out just fine. It's waiting in line at the coffee shop, waiting for your friend to meet up with you in public, sitting in the waiting room for your appointment, or looking out the window of a bus while you wait to arrive at your destination. Opportunity patience is another flavor, but not one I'm practicing either. This is more long form than utility patience since you might be waiting an extra few days or weeks for a package to arrive for the opportunity of a lower shipping cost, or waiting a few months or years for a different technology to come out that would be a better fit for the project you're working on, or waiting until winter to buy summer clothing because it's cheaper. Those types of patience aside, what I'm practicing is something I like to call divine patience. And before I even describe what that means, I need to step back and explain why I call it that. With a mission statement as lengthy and valuable, to me, as divine patience, I find it necessary to pretend that this personal goal of mine is important. Because it is. So, using wording to dress up the point helps put me in the right mindset to arrive at this Sisyphean task. We have to pretend our goals are important, because they are. So, as silly as it sounds, using a technique like fanciful wording is one effective way of getting there. As for what divine patience is, it's the ability to be patient for the longest periods of time a human can comprehend, by looking at such situations as part of the much, much bigger picture. For example, self-improvement is a lengthy process. When you're doing it yourself, it might not feel as long compared to when you're watching someone else go through it. I'd certainly argue that my depressive rut doesn't feel as lengthy as the depressive ruts of some of my friends and loved ones. That's partially because of psychological time dilation, since a depressive rut feels like a quick blur from your hindsight perspective due to how mental illness can change our perception of time. But when you're not time inebriated by depression and looking at it from a healthier reference, it feels longer watching someone else go through it. This lack of convenient psychological time dilation also impairs our ability to apply divine patience to this situation, depressive ruts, when it happens to other people. You'll feel as if they don't want to listen to your advice, swat away any mention of a possible way to improve their situation, and just genuinely don't want to make an effort to get better because they'd rather hopelessly lie down and rot. Here's the thing, though. I was doing the exact same damn things when I was in my own depressive rut, but wasn't conscious of how annoying these behaviors were to people who wanted to help since I lacked that external perspective at the time. Waiting for someone to improve through something as major as this, while still having the persistence and, here it comes, divine patience to stay with them is one such exercise in this flavor of patience. In a more general sense, this practice of divine patience teaches you that helping a person out doesn't always result in them making steps towards a better life. Your generosity is more likely to translate to their lives being slightly more bearable or even enjoyable for a short moment, and sometimes even, that moment can lead them to make progress. Other times, it's just about getting a break and nothing else. This is not too dissimilar from how donating to a charity doesn't return immediate results, or how going out to a protest or doing activism doesn't immediately result in policy changes. It's the battle not the war type of thinking. It's understanding that winning battles might not progress the war, and that said war is a flurry of many battles. What's also important to note is that even if you do win all the battles and try your best, in Captain Picard's words, one can make no mistakes and still lose. That could mean doing everything you can to help a person out of a depressive rut and still seeing them there, or donating to a charity that ends up defunct years later, or acting as part of a political movement that later dissolved. To summarize this practice of divine patience, it teaches you that returns on larger projects, people, charity, societal change, they do not have immediate returns, and sometimes none at all despite those efforts. The presence of divine patience is both the persistence to keep going despite the lack of those immediate returns, and also pushing your frustration to the side in the event that these endeavors end up fruitless. More than just patience with large projects, another practice of divine patience is patience with the times. Leftists feel this frequently because they embody politics and ideas that are constantly years, if not decades, ahead of their time, and are frustrated that those things haven't come to fruition despite the solutions being obvious to them in the present moment. Divine patience is understanding that big machines move slow, and that this planet is a machine with 8 billion parts. This doesn't mean that we should slow the march of progress, but rather understand that making large societal change takes time. Speaking of time, this practice of patience with the times is also about understanding that we're a product of the times. I'm sure I don't need to be the 50th person to complain to you about in and how things aren't built to last and are made with much lower quality than a few years ago, but this isn't too different from wood furnishing in the 80s. Seriously, try getting a house, a firearm, anything without wood furnishing in the 80s. Good luck walking into an AV shop and buying a CRT TV, VCR, speaker set receiver, and cabinet to set that all in that didn't have wood furnishing. You can't. Same with cheap, thin records from the 70s. Try going to a record store and buying records that weren't pressed quickly and with less grams of vinyl than the ones years before. You'll really need to go out of your way to find those during that decade. 
And what's the result of this? We look back at a record from the 70s and say, it's so thin, it's definitely from the 70s. Or a VCR from the 80s and think, hmm, wood furnishing, of course, that's such an 80s thing. And in a decade or so, we'll look back at those consumer products and think, ah, it's built like shit. This reeks of the 2020s. That doesn't make in shitification okay, but the divine patience lesson here is that you cannot avoid being a product of the times, and that part of these times is in shitification. It didn't last forever, just like wood furnishing and thin records didn't last forever either. If understanding that we're a product of the times, and that the times don't last forever, isn't enough to help your patience with it all, I'll offer one more perspective of mine that might help. There's this common, half-joking sentiment about being born too late to explore the seas and too early to explore the cosmos. Or, the cringier way people made this same point a decade ago was the common complaint about being born in the wrong generation. I can understand that feeling because we have this missing tile syndrome where we pay attention more to things that were missing during other times, just as a person who dislikes their baldness might pay more attention to people with hair. But here's my contrast. Maybe you're here because that's where you're needed. Maybe you're a revolutionary in 21st century late-stage capitalism and not early France because you were needed here, not there. I consider myself a romantic, and this is a terrible time right now to be one of those because of how devoid the world is right now of romance. But maybe that's the point. Maybe I am a romantic during this period and not during one where it was booming because it is my role to bring that kind of beauty back into the world. It is true that we are put here without a given or inherent purpose, so just as it's important to pretend that your greatest goals are important, it also helps to pretend that you were put here for some kind of special reason, or that you were needed here in this time for that special reason. Hell, those two things go hand in hand. If you believe your purpose here is to make others happy, to bring back romance and revolution, then you have your important goals set out for you. I do believe that kindness and patience are two big salt-of-the-earth types of things. Even when we feel like we don't know what to do, or are dizzied by an overwhelming and dramatic world, we always have kindness and patience. It is rock solid, and it is there for us, and we can keep it close to our chest for as long as we please. Ironically, they are good grounding principles for those who wish to reach for the stars. The future's utopia is only limited by how much kindness and patience we hold with us as we approach it.